Yes. So it's being recorded at the moment. So um, <clears throat> my name is Kenneth Uzwansa, and I'm the course instructor for this specific course. And as you already know, um, this course um, basically center on, I think you are the Codell, you are the Codell group, if I, if I really get it. Sorry about that. So I need to, it seems the outline that I'm sharing is what is um, a different outline. Sorry about that. Okay, so please bear with me for some few minutes to um, share. The main slide. Okay. What's happening? All right, well, I have it now, let me, yeah. So um, this course, as I earlier opined, would um, delve more into what psychology is all about. So within a course outline, as I said, my name is Kenneth Uswansa, and that's my contact um, details and all that, in case you want um, any clarification or any anything you can what you can um, easily what to reach out to concerning the course that we are doing. So um, basically, this course would um, would expose you to understand some basic principles, in especially psychology, in especially psychology. So um, in doing this, um, we will delve into some principles of behavior in relation to what learning is all about. So what are some of the ways and means in which people learn certain behaviors? That's what we'll be doing. Then apart from that, we would also tackle human development. So from conception to adulthood what are some of the developmental stages humans um, typically go, go through? So we'll be dealing with, okay, what are some of the physical development that happens throughout prenatal stage to adulthood? Also, what are some of the cognitive development in terms of people memorizing stuff, thinking, making decisions, how a child makes certain decisions or think how is it different from even an adult or an adolescent, the developmental milestones in terms of their cognitions? Then also would also would also go through some social development from childhood to adolescence. Okay. Apart from that, um, we would also deal with some biological, um, some basic biological processes how um, biology can be linked to behavior. So, our, so physiologically, what are some of the things, especially our main target will be the brain, how the brain to a large extent 
influence our behavior. So if someone is um, anxious or depressed, how does even the brain regulate a person to go through that sort of depressive phase? Then, um, apart from that, we would also be dealing with um, sensation and perception. So how do we sense things with our five sense organs? And how does these five sense organs um, go to our brain for even interpretation? So it going to the brain for interpretation is what is referred to as perception. So for instance, for you to see that, oh, this is color white. So how does the eyes in itself um, work to get those information and those information will be sent into the brain for interpretation. That's perception for you to say, oh, this is color white. So what are the main things that goes into, into it? We'll delve into it also. Okay, then um, we would also tackle some group behaviors, especially. Why do some people, they are more or less discriminatory towards others? What are some of the prejudicial or, or information they have about people that make them stigmatize or, and also discriminate towards some people? So basically, this is what um, these these are the main topics we would be tackling. So, um, in terms of um, the the topics, as I earlier opined, this is how it has been structured. Then, with assessment, in terms of this course, um, since it is online, we're doing a series of assessment. I regard. So, um, and it will be some little quizzes that will help so that um, by the time we get to the um, end of semester examination, you've done several quizzes in such that you have what you have about 30% of your marks settled somewhere. That helps because in the past, what we've observed is that. Sometimes in final examination, anything could happen. Sometimes it could be that, okay, someone might even fall ill, which could what, which could decline the person's performance. So if you have um, maybe um, some 30% somewhere, then it means that during the exam final examination, even if things doesn't go well, like the way you were expecting, it will help to, uh, to push you. And I think, if you're also aware, when it comes to the health sector, your pass mark is basically 50%. So it means any score below 50 is a, it's a failure. That's one thing you need to know. Okay, so I think um, Kasim Saudatu, please, your hand is up. Please, some of our colleagues are seeing an uh, issue. Please let them into the class. Yeah, so I have I've admitted most of them. They are still joining. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you too. Okay. So um in terms of assessment, there'll be some assignments. I'm still thinking about it, whether it's possible looking at your number. <laughs> but in terms, sorry about that. But in terms of um, short pieces, if there's something that'll be done often. And I think yesterday um, I had some brief discussion with your course rep. And I was told that when it comes to um, the GCUC uh, platform, online platform, where I'll be sharing information with you, you've not been trained on it yet. So it means most of you, none of you are on that platform. So until one thing you should know is that as time goes on, um, you'll be trained on that and 
you are expected to visit the platform often. You are expected to visit the platform. Why? Because that will be where I would be um, sharing whatever quizzes I expect you to do. Probably the time I'll be sharing even information. Even um, the Zoom link for today. <laughs> Sorry, I announced it on that platform until your course rep um, alerted me that, okay, you are not currently on a platform and you have no how it works. But moving forward, um, please note that that will be the, the platform I'll be using to what uh, to communicate um, information to you. Hence, it is really, really imperative that you get yourself abreast with um, how it is wet. Okay. So um, I have some um, materials for you that you can also watch. You can also um, download it yourself and, and read on it because I use, I got information from these materials to prepare a slice. Okay. So I think some some people are scribbling on um, on it. I don't know whether yes, there's this this person using the red ink to scribble. So please, please desist from 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 that, or else it might disrupt. I'm trying. To, I've disabled annotation, but I'm surprised. Okay, I think it has been done now. Okay, so that'll be all when it comes to the outline of um, this course. That'll be all. So let me start. Let's start with um, this course in itself. So as I earlier opined, if you have any question, feel free to, uh, to raise up your hand using the emoji and I'll be ready to uh, teach. Yeah. All right. <clears throat> So, um, oh, what's up? Uh, so, you remember I asked the class, what have you heard when it comes to psychology? <laughs> and I earlier indicated that some people think the moment you are, say, a psychologist or you are reading psychology, then it means that you can read their minds. You can easily what know what they are thinking about. You can easily know what they are thinking about. And um, and read their minds. But interestingly, it is one of the misconception, meaning that it is not true. There's no way anyone can what can read anyone's mind in that regard. There's no way anyone can do that. Apart from that, some people even think um, certain magic tricks they see on televisions, social media, and all that, they are all part of um, psychology. And interestingly, nope, they are not part of psychology. Magic tricks, magic tricks and uh, stuff, mm -hmm. they are not part of psychology. Yeah. Again, um, some even think people who um, are able to tell individuals about their future they are also do they are also um, putting some um, psychological what tricks on others there's no way in psychological realms anyone can what can be able to foretell someone's what future that is not part of psychology that's not how psychology is performed so those things you see on social media or where, wherever you find yourself in, in terms of such things, it is not within the realms of psychology. That's what I want you to know. Okay. So if all these things we are saying is not part of psychology, then what is 
basically psychology. So you can see that per your slide, I have pulled in it that psychology is rather about the what's, how's, and why's of human behavior. So it means that our main focus is on finding out, understanding um, individuals' behavior. So if we've seen a behavior someone is doing, our main focus is finding out ah, what really made this person to do this behavior or yes, to engage in this type of behavior. Why? Why did that person do it? So in future, how can we even what prevent um, the person from engaging in same act? So these are some of the questions we are we try to what we try to ask in terms of understanding why someone did something or engage in a particular particular act. Okay, so <clears throat> Kuhn et al. or Kuhnia 2004 defined psychology in this fashion. So when you read certain certain books, they have different um, definitions for psychology, but you could see that some key terms runs through all the definitions you will come across. So Kuhn, for instance, defines psychology as the scientific study of human behavior and other dual organisms. So Kuhn will find that psychology is the scientific study of human behavior and other lower organisms and other lower organisms so you will see that within this definition i have boarding uh boarding um certain terms that is scientific study and behavior so these are the main <clears throat> terms that runs through all the definitions that you would what you would come across. These are the two the key terms you find in all the definitions that <clears throat> you find in. So in any book, when they are defining psychology, they will talk about the fact that psychology is a science. Yet at the same time. They'll talk about the fact that psychology understudies behavior. So they'll tell, tell you these things. It is a science. And also, uh, the main target is that we are understanding a behavior. So these are the key terms. So, how did um, <clears throat> we got to know, we, we got to carve out the term psychology? So, psychology in itself the word psychology, it came from where? So usually we normally say that it comes from two Greek words. And we see that I've bought in them, psyche and logos, psyche and logos. So psyche means mind, then logos means knowledge or study. <clears throat> So when you combine them, it means understanding the mind, or yes, having knowledge about what about um, the mind. So that's what we've indicated. That is, it is about understanding people and the mind. Understanding people and the mind. All right. So as I said, when you go through the definition, we've been able to um, define psychology as what? As a science. So if it is a science, then it means that it goes through systematic procedures. So please, um, in order not to dis disrupt anyone, when you, when you join, kindly make sure that you have muted yourself. Kindly make sure that you've muted yourself. All right. So... Um, 
if it is a science, then it means that it follows some um, steps or procedures to understand any behavior. Or it has certain assumptions that, that it follows. So let's find out in any science what makes us say any, any um, study is scientific. So you can see um, I have put in it characteristics of scientific study. So in any study that we, um, we are doing, we find out what really makes it a science. So for us to say that any course or study is, is a science, first of all, one of the key characteristics is that there should be an empirical evidence. There should be an empirical evidence or backing. That's one of the core things um, that helps us to know that, oh, this study is really what? A scientific study. So when we say there should be empirical backing or evidence, what does it really mean? So what we are saying is that that study it should be something that should be verifiable in the sense that um, anyone can what can um, observe it with their five senses and come up with what with um, conclusive evidence. So anyone should, could easily what, confirm and say, oh, this is there. Like when you say there's an evidence, evidence means that you are proving to us that, okay, this thing really what so in any behavior that we are studying there should be evidence or um information buttressing that that thing really what exists so it means that to get any evidence what are the things we need to do you are trying to what obtain information the same thing applies to <clears throat> psychology when we are studying behavior for us to say that oh this person is an extrovert you don't just say it for saying sake you need to first what gather an information or this person he's too aggressive you don't just say it for saying sake you have to gather information obtain information <clears throat> so to obtain information, we don't also rely on one technique and use it to come to conclusion and say, oh, based on this um, technique I use to gather information, that means this person's behavior is true. So what are the various techniques we use to gather information about any behavior? We are studying. Usually in, um, in psychology, first you are supposed to observe the person's behavior. You first have to observe the person's behavior. After you've observed, the next thing for you to do is that go to the person and do one on one interviews. We call it interviews, have one on one discussion with the person to find out what is really happening. Then the next thing for you to do is to do a test, is to do a test. So let's use this practical example. Let's say I have observed um, that, oh, of late, Kojomansa is too sad. For the past one week, it seems always Kojoman is sad. Or you've been telling people that ah, of, of late Kojoman looks really sad. So, how did you come to a conclusion to say Kojoman looks sad? It's highly possible that you have observed 
Kwejo Mansa for a while that sometimes he's alone, he'll be crying. Apart from that, it's possible that you so, you've also observed, you've also seen Kwejo Mansa not associating himself with what? With people. And of late, even weekends, whereby Kojo Mansa um, loves soccer. So he, would, he, he could have maybe, he, he used to go to uh, maybe, um, or he used to go and hang out with his friends just to watch DSTV on weekends. All of a sudden, it looks like Kojo Mansa always wants to be in the room, sleeping and everything. So upon all these evidences, you've just observed and you are, you've come to a, a conclusion that, oh, Kojo Mansa is depressed. Is it really <clears throat> a good thing to come to a conclusion like that, especially a clinician? You, you a health worker, as a, as a health worker, you've been in a clinical setting. Is it really, really a good thing to all of a sudden assume based on observation alone. So that's why we are saying, you don't have to only rely on one technique. Good. You observing the person's behavior is one of the, is one of the techniques. But in making full diagnosis and saying someone is depressed, you have to go a step further. Don't just rely on only one thing. So after you've observed Kojo Mansa's behavior, the next thing for you to do is interview to the person. Oh, Charlie Kojo, of late, Memo said, you don't even what? You don't even eat. And always you, you, you are in your room. At first, you, you, during weekends or on Saturdays, I was expecting you to yes. even, go to your friends and watch, um, TV with them, but of late you don't do it. What is really happening? Because sometimes observation alone, you observing alone, you might be wrong somewhere. It could be that okay, Kojumansa is not depressed, but maybe he's fasting, so he's using that time as a way to as a way to um, spiritually prepare himself. So hence he wouldn't even what visit anyone or whatsoever. So that's why usually it is much better if you further what go to the person, do the interviews, one-on-one -on -one interviews with the person. So right now, when you do that, you've been able to what observe, you've been able to do an interview. The next thing for you to do is that after the person has confirmed what you observe, if the person is telling, you, oh, yeah, of late, I say. Charlie, due to one or two reasons, so um, I have um, someone, or I, I just have had a, a, a broken heart. Someone ditched me, and so on and so forth. Then that is what's giving you enough evidence to know that oh, this person is really depressed. Even with that, what we are saying is that after you've done an observation, you've gone to Kojumansa to have one -on one discussions with him or her, which is the interview. You have to do further testing. And in psychology, we call something known as psychological testing that needs to be done. To, to finally confirm that, oh, this person is really depressed. <clears throat> so for instance, in psychology, if someone is depressed, we have a popular test which is normally used. So let me quickly search for it and share with you so that um, what you would appreciate it well. All right. Okay, so I'm sharing. So we have this popular test known as Beck Depression Inventory. So after you've observed the person's behavior, 
and the person you've also done interview with the person one on one we've had one on one discussion with the person the person has fully um told you confirm that oh i don't of late i don't feel what i don't feel i'm sad i'm depressed and i was even giving you gone further to give you what re, what 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 is really causing him to uh, to be in that sort of mood <clears throat> what we are saying is that do further testing by printing out this instrument and let a person fill so could you answer let could you answer what fill these questions so you can see that they've indicated um <clears throat> I do not, question one, I do not feel sad. I feel sad. I'm sad all the time. I'm so sad and un, uh, unhappy that I cannot stand it. So it means, could you answer would what? Would circle one of the options for question one, move to question two, circle zero, two, three, any of the options. So in all the questions, could you answer is supposed to tick or circle only one of the options. So it's about 21 questions. After Kojima answer has filled this questionnaire, you will then do your um, interpretation and scoring. So how do you score? The key thing is you just sum the numbers Kojima answer take or circle. So for instance, let's say question one, Kojomansa indicated two, meaning I'm sad all the time. Then question two, Kojomansa circled one. I feel discouraged about the future. Question three, Kojomansa circled two. The means question one, he circled two. Question two, he circled one. Question three, he circled two. So it means it to be one or two plus one plus two. You, you add their scores together. So it means that from question one up to 21, the numbers Kojumans are circled or ticked. Add all of them together. And that will be Kojumans score for this instrument, which is Beck Depression Inventory. So after Kojum you've given this to Kojumansa, you, the psychologist or the health worker, you are tasked to what? To score Kojumansa's um, say performance on depression and put it in a fashion. So that will help you to know if Kojumansa is really sad or is really depressed or not. Is really depressed or not. So per the scoring and interpretation, they've indicated if Kojomansa score one to ten, then it means that his his condition is considered to be what normal. After you, the person has taken question one up to twenty one, and he or she scores one, a total score of one to ten, what this instrument is telling you is that then it means Kojomansa's reaction is what it's normal. But if he scores um, 11 to 16, then it means that he, he has moderate, sorry, mild mood disturbance. Then in case he scores over 40, it means Kojomansa has an extreme form of depression. So you could see that in diagnosing someone as depressed, you don't just use just one technique and come up with what, with a conclusion. These three um, techniques plays an important role, even in any clinical setting. So for instance, when you go to the hospital, you are, you are, you are sick and you go to the hospital. Maybe you are, suffer, you are suffering from malaria and you go to the hospital to see a doctor. The first thing is that the doctor would what would do one-on-one -on -one discussion with you, which is interviews. And in the course of the person doing the interview, 
the, the physician or the doctor is also doing his or her own observations. Sometimes if you tell the person or you feel feverish and so on and so forth, the person sometimes would, what, would touch, use the lamp to touch you to see if the place is hot using um, a thermometer. Or sometimes he will see your manner whereby, okay, it's more or less like you've what, you've quelled yourself, one more, one more, telling the person that, oh, this person feel cold. So that's the observation aspect. Apart from observing, the person, the doctor, the physician will also um, ask you questions. Oh, and wait a minute, you are telling the person, oh, I haven't been able to eat, telling him that, okay, it's more or less like you've lost appetite. And what have you. So after the person has observed, done the interview, what's next? The person will then tell you, oh, any quiet labra will write a lab, a lab, um, yes, a form for you, for you to take it to the lab. Yeah. So it means that the person used these three techniques I'm talking about. Then afterwards, after the lab has come or the lab resource is in, then the physician would what would make his final, his or her final verdict. And so, oh, looking at the lab, oh, you're quite, your WBC is what is high, telling me that there's an infection. Also, um, it seems you have malaria what, infections. So it means that you have malaria, then would what write drugs for you. So that's the system in place in anywhere, in any setting you find yourself in. When gathering information, that's you are getting evidence as to, where, as to whether that behavior is true or not. Okay. So the next thing under scientific study is replicability. <clears throat> So what we are saying is that with replicability, it has to do with you repeating, repeat, to replicate. That's where it comes from. So we are saying all the procedures of the study must be described so that anyone who wants to repeat the study could come out with similar results. So it means all the procedures you went, you use, to gather your information. So there's a buildup of critical evidence. What this is saying is that the, the techniques you use, all the procedures, techniques that you use to gather information to say that, oh, this person is depressed. You need to what you need, um, describe it and even put it into writing in most situations so that anyone who wants to repeat the same thing could what could easily repeat it and come out with similar means or results. So let's say that someone is depressed. What we are saying is that in most situations, you did, did your observation, put it into writing that, okay, you did, your, you did an observation to come up with what, with a conclusion that this patient is depressed. Again, let us know how you did even the interviews, the steps you used in the interviews, what kind of questions you asked to, do, to derive that, okay, this person is depressed. Apart from that, let us also know what type of test you even use because with depression, the test that I earlier showed you, we have different versions of it. So it's even important that you let, as a physician, you let the mass know the type of test you use to arrive at a conclusion that, oh, this person is what is depressed. So that if anyone even wants to challenge your diagnosis, the person could what could go through the steps you took 
and come out with what? With similar results and so oh. Based on the, um, the steps he took, if I repeat it on the same patient or even another patient also suffering from the same condition, I am likely to arrive at what? As the same conclusion and say, oh, this person is what? Is depressed. So that's the essence of replicability. So please, I'm moving, I'm moving on. If you have any question, um, you can just use the emoji to raise up your hand so that I'll pause and what and answer your question. Yeah. So if nobody has used the emoji, I am just assuming that um, that means you're all okay. There are no questions at hand. All right. So the next one is quantifiability. Quantifiability. So someone might um, think, hey, so when it comes to psychology, how can you put it in quantity? Can you put psychology in quantity? Just because, for instance, when I ask your, your, what, your weight, your height, you can easily measure it and tell me that, okay, I weigh maybe 150 kilograms or my height is, say, 170 centimeters. You can easily what, or 1.7 meters. You can easily what, do that. But in case I ask you, how anxious are you? Can you be able to quantify it and tell me, oh, I am 2% anxious or I am 5 cause anxious? Can you, can you do that? You could see that is something that is really, really improbable. It is something that is hard for you to um, do that. But interestingly, um, psychologists have come up with ways and means in which we can easily what quantify all the psychological constructs you know of. So like the instrument I earlier showed you, like the instrument I earlier showed you, you could see that this is measuring depression and what it is giving to the patient, the patient is supposed to circle um, one of the numbers assigned to the various questions. So question one, for instance, we have number zero to three and zero means I do not feel depressed. I do not feel sad. So it means that the person is telling us when it comes to him or her, he doesn't feel sad if he or she takes or circles zero. So please, I have, so please, over, but I assume some of you, you unmute yourself or when you join, you don't want to mute yourself, which makes it quite difficult for me to keep track. So it means always I need to come back and do that. So please, um, to let things flow, the moment you join, make sure that you mute yourself. The only time you can unmute yourself is after you've, you've used the emoji and oh, wow. I've called you. I, I like, I know that, yeah. Again, again. <laughs> So please, all right. So um, as I was saying, it's difficult to quantify psychological constructs. So psychologists have devised this format so that when this instrument is given to the patient, we can easily put their scores in quantity, like me saying, oh, Let's say Kwame Mansa or Mensa had um, a score of say 25 after he filled this um, instrument. We can see 
Kwame Mensah score, score on depression is one. It's 25. Then afterwards, use this to interpret. So you can see um, per the scoring and interpretation, you are saying a score of 21 to 30 means moderate depression. Then we can say, oh, Kwame Mensah has a moderate depression. So that's how um, quantifiability or what's the quantifiability is all about. That's what quantifiability is all about. Then the next characteristic of any science, the next characteristic of any science is generalizability. Generalizability. So usually what you're saying is that um, whatever findings or information we've gotten from these the patient is this something we can what we can extend it to the large masses or the entire individuals and say oh anyone who is depressed the person should always have low mood separate or distance himself from people, shouldn't sleep a lot or sleep or should always feel uh, that he or she is worthless or hopeless. So whatever information we got it from Kwame Mansa, we are able to find similar as happening in people then we can say that, oh, Kwame Mansa's um, findings we, get, we got is something that is generalizable. We can generalize or extend it to the entire individuals and say, oh, if anyone goes through depression, this is how they behave. So that will be all when it comes to um, characteristic of of a scientific study. So please, if you have a question, kindly let me know. You can use the emoji to raise up your hand. Any questions? So... Okay, Naomi, now please, your hand is up. I'm not clear with the generalization. The explanation you give. Okay, Naomi, so I will explain that later. Yes, well, I realized another person's hand was up. Okay, I think Blandina, if I get your pronunciation right. Blandina. So please, okay. unmute your mic and speak. Okay. Good morning, sir. Um, Good morning. Please, I want to know, as you were saying, you don't, you don't just look at just one feature or one point and just say the person is depressed. So what if the, the client comes to you and just say, Madam, I feel depressed or Madam, I'm depressed. Where, that, where do you start from? Yes. Okay. Okay. So I'll take the last question, then I'll answer your words or I'll give you responses. But if you have any question, you can still keep it coming. So Evelyn. Hello, sir. Yes, Evelyn, please go ahead. Please, that quantification, can you re-explain it again? All right, all right, thank you. So, um, first, one of, well, I think one of you wanted me to explain what the generalizability is all about. And I said with generalizability, after you've um, done, you've understood one person behavior. So I use Kwejo Mansa, um, Kwame Mansa as an example. We've been able to gather evidence that's the empirical backing. 
to know that oh, per our observation, our interviews and psychological testing, we're able to come out that oh, Pamir Mansa always has to, that means he always feels sad. He always feel worthless. He always distance himself from people. He always, he doesn't want to what want to do at first, the pleasurable activities he used to do, like okay, playing football and so on and so forth. So hence, we are saying he is depressed. This information that we've gotten from Kwame Mansa, can we extend it to the, the entire individuals and say, oh, if anyone is depressed, these are some of the main symptoms the person is, is expected to experience. So if we are able to extend it to the large masses and come up with what? The same or, or similar um, conclusions that, oh, the large masses that we're able to find, they also experience the same thing. So we can easily say that, oh, then it means that the large masses are also depressed. Hence, anyone who is depressed, symptom A, B, C, and D found in Kwame is the same thing we are likely to, to find that person. So if we are able to do that, then we can say, oh, then it means the findings that we got from Kwame is something that is generalizable. So the same thing applies to COVID-19. You know, scientists, when it happened in China, when it happened in China, they were still trying to um, understand the behavior until they were able to come up with what with similar um, common symptoms and say, oh, anyone who experienced COVID-19, these are the possible symptoms we are, the, the person is likely to get. So after they've been able, they were able to come up with that um, findings, we can say for sure that, okay, the findings they've gotten from China is something that is what generalizable because they've been able to extend it to the large society and say that anyone who experienced the same phenomenon, this is how your symptoms will be like. So that's what generalizability is all about. And another person also um, talk about the fact that quantifiability was confusing. What I'm saying is that in any scientific, in any scientific study, we usually want to put things in quantity. So that's why I, I said, when I ask you your weight or height, you can easily what measure and tell me that, okay, I, I weigh this kilograms. My height is in, this, is in meters or centimeters. You can easily tell me because you could easily measure. But what of when I, tell, when I ask you, how depressed are you? Or what's your depression level? Can you give me a score of your anxiety? Currently, it will be hard for you to um, measure. But the interesting thing is the um, questionnaire or the instrument that I showed you earlier, you could see that always they would ask you questions all right, but every question has certain uh, categories. So you're supposed to take one of the numbers. After you've taken the number, then you do what you, they would add your scores for the various numbers you take. So psychologists have come up with a way in which we can what we can quantify or measure all the psychological constructs you know of. So after it has been measured, then we can score and interpret and say, oh, this person has mild depression, this person has a moderate depression, and so on. All right, then I think the last person asked a question about um, how would you be able to know if someone just come to you and say, oh, um, a patient just come to you and say, I feel depressed. Well, how would you go by it? You use the same technique. Like when you go to, when a doctor, you go to a doctor and you tell the doctor, oh, doctor, I suspect I have malaria. You are the one suspecting that you have malaria, but it could be possible that it's not even malaria that you are, you are suffering from. 
the same thing applies to this. When a patient comes to you and says, oh, I feel depressed. I, I, I believe I feel depressed. You have to use the three techniques to gather information. Observe. Do one-on-one -on -one interviews. Ask the person's um, information about, okay, what makes you think you feel depressed? Um, for the past two weeks, um, do you do you feel worthless? Have you committed any? Have you had any suicidal intention? So you gathering information about depression would even help you to know whether it's really depression the person is suffering from or not. So after all these information have been gathered, then you can make a final verdict and say, okay, then let me give you psycho, uh, my psychological test to see if truly is depression that you're suffering from or something else. All right. So I think um, I would <clears throat> give opportunity for one last person to ask the qu a question, then I'll move forward. So I think the last person is Sylvia. Your hand is up. So kindly you go ahead. Sylvia. Yes, please. Sir, with the quantifiability. I asked in the chat, but you are not responding. Okay. I was asking if um pain is psychological and if uh, measurements of pain, you know, we have a skill to measure pain. If is um we can classify it under the quantifiability why you ask the person on the scale of zero to ten how much like how severe is your pain exactly because it's hard for it's hard for um um any physician to know okay the number of pains you are you are suffering from mm. so that's why um these things has been what has been devised in such a way that the patient, him or herself, will be the one to, to tell how much pain he or she is in. So if you if the person rates at a higher rate, telling us that okay, then that means the person is suffer, is having a severe pain. So something ought to, to be done because no. as I've been saying, you can't read a person's mind to know how much pain or how much psychological constructs the person is experiencing until the person what reports. All right. Okay. So most conditions, if it is, if it is purely psychological, then it means that we have a tool or an instrument to measure it. I think someone asked this on the chat, within a chat. Okay, so let me go ahead. So the next thing is behavior. So you remember I said with the definition for psychology, we have um, two key terms, scientific study, then the next thing is what is behavior. So we are done with the science aspect. We are moving on to the behavioral aspects of psychology. So what is behavior in itself? So what we are saying is that um, behavior it refers to the way in which an individual responds to a stimulus. So when we say a stimulus, in layman's perspective, a stimulus is anything within your environment, even shoes, chairs, people around you, dogs, or animals, not living and living things, every, everything, they are all part of stimulus. So how you respond to such organisms around you and, and things around you is what is referred to as behavior. So in terms of um, behavior, we have um, two main or two broad types. We have overt, the one without C, overt behavior. And we have covert, the one with C, covert behavior. So let's see what overt is all about. So overt behavior, what we are saying is that there are behaviors that you could easily observe with all your senses. You can easily what, uh, observe with your five senses. So you can, if someone is doing something, is performing an act and you could easily sense it 
with your five sense, sense organs, then that should tell you that it is an overt, like someone dancing, someone even talking is a behavior. So it's an, it's an overt behavior. Someone um, even what, even performing an act. Okay. So all the things that you can, what you can sense with your five sense organs, a dog backing, they are all overt behavior. Then covert will be the opposite. It means that there are behaviors that we can't easily what observe with us with our sense organs. So usually you have to use instruments or what have you to what to measure them. So a typical example is someone's intelligence level. You can't really what observe someone's thinking patterns or cognitive cognition. You can't what you can't um, really observe. So that would basically fall under covert behavior. Covert. All right. <clears throat> so <clears throat> when it comes to these two main broad types of behaviors, we can further divide them into four different types, or we can categorize them into four types. So the first one is reflex behavior, reflex behavior. So what we are saying is that certain behaviors that we usually respond to with naturally or automatically, they are all referred to as reflex. Back in JHS and SHS, I think it's, you've come across the term reflex act, the reflex act. That's a typical reflex behavior. So typically, such behaviors, it's not like, okay, you intentionally what, make an act towards it, but you have no control. It comes automa automatically. So um, I think the example that I use was <clears throat> as a human, when even, um, you step on a nail or even a pin, <clears throat> what do you do? You what, you withdraw your, your legs or your hand. Yeah, you withdraw your leg, which is an automatic response. It's not like, okay, you have to think about it before you what, you withdraw your, your leg. Nope. You automatically what, withdraw. The same thing applies to ladies when you are cooking. And unfortunately, you forgot to use a napkin to take the hot plate from, to take it out, the hot saucepan from the hot plate. So you use your bare hands to touch the hot saucepan. You don't have to think about it before you withdraw your hands. Automatically, you are, you, you are wired in such a way that you withdraw your hand. At a faster pace. So all these things are reflex behavior. In animals, especially dogs, they also have a reflex behavior whereby the moment you, if you've really, if you have a dog around, you can understand this type of behavior. The moment you you are about to give it a food to eat, a food which is really, really one of its favorite, you could see that all of a sudden. Mm. The dog would protrude a tank, then saliva will be what will be oozing out of the mouth because the dog has seen an appetizing food. So it is even what responding before um, the meal is what is given to it. So what a dog is doing is a, is a reflex behavior. It's not like, okay, it has to think, pond over it before it performs that act. It is something that it naturally naturally respond to um, the stimulus. All right. Then the next one is um, goal directed behavior. Goal directed behavior. With um, goal directed behavior, as I've defined, this is where there is a need in an individual 
and the person strives to satisfy it with a certain behavioral pattern. So in our setting, for instance, goal directed behavior is when you have a goal in mind or an aim in mind. So you, you engage in a certain act as a means to what as a means to achieve that goal or plans you've set up for yourself. A typical example is I know some of you are even um most of you are, are working. So why have you come back to school? Some people most we can have what different goals and that goal is what is what really fooling as to what to to engage in certain acts. So it could be that someone can say, oh, um, I'm already what, um, say, um, a nurse. But the thing is, I want to further my education for promotion so that I would maybe I have a diploma set in nursing. So I've come back to school so that um, I'll be a degree nurse and wear what the white uniform and also get promotion and also my, sal my salary would, what would increase. It could be that that is what is really what fueling that person. So the person has an, a goal in mind that, okay, I want this promotion really, really what hard. So since you, you want this promotion and you've come back to school, what sort of behaviors would you engage in? You try to what, take lessons serious, always attend lectures, take quizzes, make sure that okay you you are taking your academic what stuff serious because you have a goal that okay i need to what i need to finish and finish well so that um i'll get what the promotion that i want so the behaviors that you are engaging in is fueled by a goal that you have in mind so when it happens like that then we call it goal directed behavior goal directed behavior then we have um, another behavior known as frustration behavior. Frustration behavior. So we are saying this was suggested by Maya in 1949. And he said, the goal of the behavior is specific. And the person tries several times, but the need is not met. Finally, when the need is met, the person does not appreciate it. The person does not appreciate it. So it means that with um, frustration behavior, it's a form of goal directed. First, it comes like, okay, a goal directed behavior, meaning that at first, the person has a goal in mind to achieve particular behavior. Like, okay, me being a student, I want to what? I want to, I have a goal that I want to be among the best students after um, graduation or after school. I want to be part of the best students so that I'll be, or I want to be the valedictorian for the nursing department. You have this goal in mind. Then, in order to achieve that goal, then it means that you need to what you need to always get A's, A's. The minimum grade should be B, B's, and even some little C's or something, because you want to um, be the overall best. So it means you need to get more A's. Then let's say, um, unfortunately, number hundred, one of the courses. The person had an F by one or two reasons. Then the following semester, the person has sorry, the academic year. The person had another F in the same course he or she resat. 
the third year, the person had an F until the fourth year, he or she had C and A. You could see that sometimes even the level of satisfaction the person was uh, might derive from passing at the fourth year, that course would not be too much as compared to if he or she had passed and pass it once and for all. Because the person might feel that, okay, I have been frustrated over the years before I've been able to achieve this feat. So hence, it doesn't, it doesn't bring too much what, uh, satisfaction, but rather he feels frustrated to achieve that sort of um, goal. All right, so um, that'll be all. Mr. Asanga, As Asanga, Mr. Asanga. Hey, sorry, Madam Asanga Janet. Madam Janet, please go ahead. Your hand is up. Master, I said mistake. Okay, okay. Mm. Then uh, Abdullah, add what to? Please, your hand is also up. Okay, so I'm, move, I'm moving on. Then the last one is um, conditioned behavior. Conditioned behavior. We are saying this consists of behavior patterns exhibited by the individual due to long-standing habitual practices adopted by the individual. So usually in conditioned behavior, sometimes we are conditioned to do one or two things. And at first, that behavior wouldn't have even evoked any, any form of any form of what um, response. But due to one or two reasons, it becomes a part of and parcel of our behavior. Because of consistent pairing, we'll delve more into, into it later. But let me give you a practical example. This is um, a broad topic on its own, which we'll delve more into it as the lesson um, we frequently meet. Let me put this in the fashion. Yeah. So um, a typical example is for someone to be um, afraid of, say, even walking through a green grass. It doesn't just come by chance. It is a typical condition behavior. It is, it, it might look weird or abnormal for someone to say, okay, when it comes to me, I don't want to walk within a green grass or is afraid of green grass, pass along a green grass. Why? Because it could be that the green grass has been paired with what? With a feared stimulus, like a snake. Maybe at first the person wasn't afraid of green, passing within green grass, but by one or two reasons, have seen videos whereby people have, have been bitten by a snake walking through a green grass, or have even, have even experienced one happening to him or someone who is very close to him or her. Maybe he saw someone, um, a friend or a relative, bitten by a snake when the person was walking through a green grass. So out of it, he or she has also developed aversion or dislike towards walking through green grass. So it means this time around, the green grass has been conditioned or has been paired with a feared stimulus that is snake for a while, whereby with time, that green grass, that at first wouldn't have even evoked any fear, is currently what evoking fear on the person, meaning anytime the person sees a green grass, you could see the person what being afraid, sometimes panting, shivering, saying, look, I don't want to what, I don't want to go near it and everything. So that's a typical conditioned um, behavior. 
and we will delve more into it later. Okay, so that's for when it comes to behaviors. So please, again, any question? Any question? So, and Cabra, please, your hand is up. Yes, sir. So good afternoon. Good afternoon. Um, so I wanted to clarify the types of behavior. We said in the, the beginning, I show you writing um, the two main types of behavior is the overs and the converse, if I'm yes. right. But I can see still, and I you come again with the conditional, the goal, the okay. reflex, and then the other one. Hey, please, I beg, clarify that which one is under which, and which of them are the two main types, or all of them are types of behavior. Thank you, sir. Right, and thank you very much. So and that's why I, I have gone back. You can see that I've, indi I've indicated. Um, the overt and the covert, they are the two main types. Then when you move to the next slide, check the first um, bordened phrase. The two main types can be categorized into three. So it means the overt and covert can further be categorized into four main types. All right. Um, Edina. Oh, sorry, yes, sir. Edna, right? Is it Edna or Edina? All right. So please go ahead. Your hand is up. All right. So I'm assuming that maybe it was a mistake. So um, I'll go ahead. Oh, sorry, sorry, sir. Please, I forgot. No, no, I didn't unmute myself. I'm sorry. Okay. Please, right. I was saying, can you please go over the condition behavior for me? Okay, so I indicated that with the condition behavior, it's more or less like um, that affects extremely people any response. It's sometimes paired with another stimulus. For a longer period so that with time that stimulus at first it doesn't evoke any response begin to evoke a response in that regard so i i don't want to bore with you with a lot of information for the meantime so that's why i've been i've been saying consistently that um we'll delve more into it later as um the lesson what um in subsequent lessons so I gave a practical example whereby I said, let's say someone is afraid of green grass. It doesn't happen by chance. Because green grass, you see the green grass, we don't expect you to, to be afraid. But it's possible that the green grass has been paired with a feared stimulus, which is say snake. So how can it be paired with a, um, a feared stimulus? It could be that, okay, the person saw um, a close relative, a close person being bitten by a cynic when that person was walking through a green grass. So subsequently, that individual has also become afraid of green grass. The person who saw his or her relative being bitten by a cynic, he has developed um, aversion for green grass. And the moment um, he gets close to green grass. You could see the person also being afraid, panting. His heart beating faster and everything. So that when you see that phenomenon happening, then we can term it as a conditioned behavior because we don't expect you to see a neutral stimulus like um, a green grass. Then all of a sudden, you're panting. But because of that green grass being paired with a fear stimulus, which is snake, that is what is really causing the person to be in that sort of position. All right. So, Nana Santua. Thank you. Yeah, sir. Please, uh, I wanted to know, were there four categories of behavior? 
if we are taking the two types, which is the overt and the covert, and we are asked to group the four categories under the types, how do we group them? You will not be tasked to group any any anything into. Okay, so in case I'm asked which of the um, categories go under overt and which goes under covert, what do I? Do? I'm not here to let you know which of them goes into because, um, in most situations, uh, reflex behavior, reflex behavior, depending on um that sort of behavior, that that means the process involved. It can be either overt or covert. Oh, okay. So that's why I said they can further be categorized into what into these four four main types so the key thing okay. is know know the distinction well and and okay and okay thank yeah. you you're welcome um then the next person is um higa i'll take the first three people Higa. so please go ahead good afternoon sir all right please if i may understand with the condition of behavior like the way you gave the example. If someone to had a car accident, is it an example of condition? Like maybe because he had an accident with car before, anytime he wants to travel, the person is panicking. Is it an example of condition behavior? To some extent, um, I, don't, I don't want it in that fashion. The accident has been paired with what? It has been paired with what? Maybe like. As I'm saying, always for um, us to see there's a conditioned behavior, two stimulus needs to be at hand. Two, two stimulus. Once at first shouldn't have evoked any, any form of what um, response or behavior in that person. Then the other, ideally, naturally, it should re, um, lead to a response. Then, when it is paired together, you could see that with time, that stimulus at first we weren't expecting it to what evoke a response. Then all of a sudden, it to be evoking the same response. I know so, currently it sounds confusing. I don't want to bore you with a lot of information for the meantime. So you just um, get to know that with conditioned behavior, it has to do with we pairing. A behavior where at first it shouldn't have a response with another behavior that we know that it should definitely evoke a response. Then with time, that behavior at first it wasn't as eliciting any, any response leads to a that's a response we want. So in subsequent lessons, um, I think you would appreciate it more. I don't want to bore you with a lot of because today is an, just an introductory part. Of what we are doing. All right. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. So let's delve into um, goals of psychology, if time would allow us. So the next one is goals of psychology. So what it basically means is that um, when it comes to psychologists, in psychology, what is the end goal? What is the end product of psychology? Or when psychologists study behavior, what do they seek to achieve? What is their ultimate goal at hand? So in terms of goals of psychology, we also have, it goes through a series of steps, like the scientific study that we did. So the first goal any psychologist intend to achieve, to describe the behavior. So when we see a behavior, our first goal at hand is that, oh, we need to describe that behavior. So the description of behavior is the same as the empirical backing, the explanation I gave for empirical backing. So any psychologist, when a behavior comes to him at hand, let's say someone is depressed, the first thing the psychologist ought to do is to describe the behavior. And in describing the behavior, it's the same as empirical evidence or backing. You have to gather information about the behavior at hand. So the person is depressed. You have to gather information. 
by using the three techniques we talk about. And what are they? You have to observe, you have to conduct interviews, then you use your psychological test. Then out of it, you come up with what? With the various symptoms. So you can see if you're understanding a behavior, after you've used these three te te techniques, you come up with some symptoms like, okay, maybe the person has lost weight. The person doesn't really sleep well. The person has difficulty with concentrating. So all these things are symptoms of depression. And how did you get information from? Based on the three techniques that you use. Also about description of behavior. Okay. Then the next thing is um, understanding, to understand or explain the behavior, to understand or explain the behavior. So after you've gathered the information, which is description of the behavior, you have to further inquire what is really causing that behavior to exist. So if the, the behavior that you were an, um, you were under, understanding was depression. You've been able to describe that, oh, Kwame Mansa has sleeping problems. He feels sad always. And he has difficulty concentrating. That's a description of aspect. What is making Kwame Mansa feel sad or have difficulties even sleeping? Why? What really caused that behavior? That's the, that's the to understand, to explain the behavior. That's what it is all about. So it means you, the psychologist needs to, or the a health practitioner needs to come up with clinical explanations as to why the person is behaving the way he or she is what is doing. The same thing applies to medical setting, let's say a physical condition. After the after the, the doctor has what has done the observation, ask the patient questions about let's say the malaria, results has come out that it is malaria. The physician needs to explain why the person was um, feeling cold, why the person was was um was um his white blood cells and everything was shot up and so on. By explaining that, oh, the person was bitten by what by a mosquito, whereby the mosquito infected the individual, that's the female anopheles mosquito, um, infected the person with what? With um, malaria parasites. Leading to what? Leading to such infection. That's the explanation the person is giving or the physician is giving. The same thing applies to mental health realms. If the person is depressed, after you've got the evidence, you need to further explain why, what really caused the person to, uh, to be, be depressed. Is it that the person lost a loved one? Or is it that the person lost a job? That is making him or her feel that, okay, this life is coming to an end. So the explanation is that what really caused the condition is what you're supposed to what bring about. And the causes could come from different angles. But from the biological point of and so, oh, it has to do with genetics. It has to do with genetics. Maybe, oh, some people might say, oh, when it comes to the person that has this sort of um, mental health condition because maybe um, his or her father or mother or relative had it. So it, is, it was likely that, okay, you also will get it leading to that. So what explanations are you giving to that 
behavior exhibited by the patient. That's the explanation aspect. All right. Then the next one is to predict. So we are saying it is the ability to anticipate an event prior to its actual performance based on knowledge of underlying causes. The knowledge of what causes depression, for instance, help to anticipate future occurrence of behavior or not. So you have a knowledge that, oh, this person um, is depressed because um, the person inherited a particular gene from the parent causing the depression. Or this person is depressed because the person uh, lost his only job and out of it, he feels that the whole world is coming to an end. So you are predicting that anyone who suffers the same fate, anyone who has um, a relative who is depressed, is also likely to what? To be depressed at some point in time. Or you are predicting that anyone who um, loses his or her job and feels that the whole world or things that the whole world has come to an end would also experience depression. So for it to, pre for it to anticipate based on um, the explanations derived is what is referred to as to predict a behavior. You're making a prediction based on previous experiences or um, explanations about that phenomenon. All right. Then the last thing is to create a change or to control. It means the same thing. To, con to control or create a change. What does it really mean? So after you've been able to gather evidence, which is to, des to describe, and also um, find possible causes, which is to explain, and also be able to anticipate and predict that, or oh, anyone who goes through, who have the same possible causes would experience the same phenomenon, which is to predict. You have to then control by, or you have to um, put up intervention measures. That will be helpful to the individuals. So the intervention measures is more or less like it is going in there to what uh, to put a halt to if it is if it if, if the behavior is a problem, it is going in there to what uh, to address that problem. That's what I mean by to create a change. So if the behavior is about depression, we don't want a lot of people to be depressed. We don't want a lot of people. So per our information so far. What interventions can we put in place to solve that problem? So those interventions is what is referred to as to create a change or to control. So if you see individuals who are depressed, usually drugs are given. Usually psychologists also go in to, to do psycho, psychotherapy for them so that their depression levels will be reduced. So the techniques being put in place to address these people, their um, problems is what is referred to as to cause a change or to control. And any psychologist role or ultimate goal is to what is to create a change or to control. That's the ultimate goal of any psychologist. All right. So um, that will be all. I'm done with the lesson. So if you have any question or clarification, here's the time to bring it on board. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You are a good teacher. Oh God, I love your teaching. Thank I you. love your teaching so much. 
Thank you. I love the way you teach. Madam Christiana. Yes, sir. All right. I love so, your teaching. Thank you. Madam Vivian, so please, if you have a question, kindly um, unmute your mic. Madam Vivian. Um, please, you haven't um, unmuted your mic. Yeah, please go ahead. Hello, good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Uh, please, like if um, I, I am obese, uh, in a family of uh, obesity people, okay. we know we are not supposed to eat fatty things. Yeah. And always I take in uh, those uh, indomie meat and all those things. Yeah. Now, I know that if I continue taking all these things, since my mother was obese, my sister also obese, I will surely also become obese. Yeah. Uh -huh. So in that sense, if my next sister comes and takes me, I'm not going to put in place all these things. I'm not going to eat heavy foods, uh, fatty foods, because I just want to be slim. Where do you classify me under this category that you've done? Yeah, you want to? Where do I classify you under which yes, of the, the host? Not the host. Like the condition that we just learned. Uh, like we haven't treated any mental mental condition yet. Um that's not the focus of um this, this discussion. And I don't think it has anything to do with any eating disorder. I think we are trying to um um find out whether it has anything to do with eating disorder. So with yes. eating disorders, for instance, we have anorexia nervosa, bulimia nervosa, pica, and so on. But the way you are describing it is more or less like a normal what um, means in which you want what you want to lose weight. Yes, no. Yeah. It has no, no um, association with um, mental disorder in that regard. Okay. All right. Mm -hmm. Okay, so please, any other question? All right, Madam Papa Amponsa. Yes, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Please, pertaining to the characteristics of the science of psychology. Okay. Is it only limited to what you made mention of, or that there are other areas that we need to research? Um, some people have different um, terms they use, but it means the same thing. But during examination, um, everything will be stick towards um, what I've taught you. So it will be related okay. to these four key terms. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so any any other thing? Okay, so if there are no further questions, then I believe that will be the end of um, today's meeting. And it was a pleasure meeting you, you all, where you you had um cordial receptiveness, and I really appreciate that. So see you, God willing. Next weekend. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Yeah, Bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Bye. Sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir.